welcome back to another edition to Military Witnesses of UAP. I'm Shannon Scott, and this is case number two. Now, I believe it's been about five years since I've seen that YouTube video. It was called UFO Crash in Peru. It's a fascinating first-hand account of an eyewitness of a crashed UAP in South America. A brief history of Jonathan. Jonathan Wagnett attended Mount Tabor High School, Salem, North Carolina. He joined the United States Marines in the delayed entry program in 1994. He then attended basic training and graduated on the 18th of June, 1895. In late September, 1995, Jonathan went into the infantry training at Camp Gregor. During training, late September 1995, Jonathan went into the infantry training. It was located at Camp Geiger. During training, Jonathan injured his back and was sent to medical patine at Camp Geiger. Jonathan then received new orders along with 10 days of leave and was sent to Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas. Training was held from February to late May 1996. Jonathan received training on the MOS-70T-12 Stinger Avenger Gunner and Air Defense Gunner on the FIM-92 Stinger. The surfaced air missile and also received training on the Avenger Weapon System, which is mounted on the back of a military Humvee. At graduation, Jonathan was reassigned to the 2nd Marine Air Wing, 28th Marine Air Control Group located at Cherry Point, North Carolina and was assigned to Battery B in June 1996. Jonathan was deployed on several operations when he was transferred to the Laser Strike Section in February 1997. After receiving training as a Weapons and Tactics Instructor, WTI in Yuma, Arizona, Jonathan then volunteered to deploy in March of 1997. Jonathan went to Peru to provide a perimeter and security to a radar installation the purpose of this installation was to track drug air traffic that entered and exited Bolivia and Peru airspace. The incident. It was March or early April 1997, late one evening. Sergeant Allen, Sergeant Atkins, and Staff Sergeant Allegra stated that there has been an aircraft crash and that it is possibly friendly and needed us to go and secure the site. Jonathan, already up due to having a 12-hour guard ship duty, it was approximately 0300 when they all departed in five or six on these. Around 0600, the vehicles went as far as they can go, stopped, and then all the Marines set off on foot through the bush. Jonathan stated that the crash site was easy to locate. He saw a huge area of land was entirely burned up. Jonathan thought the area looked strange or just didn't look right. Jonathan was up front at point, approximately 10 to 20 meters with Sergeant Atkins and Sergeant Allen. Everyone had radios, maps, and compasses to assist in navigating. Jonathan describes that when the object crashed, it went up a hill and then off into the side of a ring of a ridge. The ridge was estimated to be about 200 feet of solid rock. The crash was buried into the side of a cliff. Jonathan didn't maneuver straight up. They approached it through the left side and walked to the top of the ridge. There they saw the craft. He was confused of what he was seeing. The craft appeared huge. As they were climbing down, he noticed that the craft was buried at a 45 degree angle into the side of a 90 foot cliff. The craft was dripping a purplish and green syrup like substance. It appeared to be everywhere. Jonathan also noticed that the fluid would change or fluctuate a different shade of color every time he looked at it. The craft had one light on it as it slowly rotated around the craft. Jonathan could still hear the craft making noise. It had a low hum to it, like an unplugged amp from a guitar. 
a really deep sound and fluctuated. Then it finally silenced. At that moment, Jonathan felt as if everything just seemed to stop. Jonathan then observed that the craft was half buried. He was able to view the back of the craft. There were several large vents that appeared to look like fish gills and thought it could be used for propulsion. Jonathan didn't see the other side of the craft, however, he assumed it looked the same as what he was looking at. He then discovered the purplish and green fluid was on his canvas. It discolored and ate through the material like acid. He later noticed that some of the hair on his arm was missing from the fluid as well. Jonathan then discovered three holes that he assumed were hatches. These holes were not flush with the main body of the craft and thought it may have been a few inches below. There was another one on the other side. He could see another hatch the same diameter and size as the top hatch. It appeared to be crooked and the side of it was half open. Jonathan didn't notice any lights coming from the hatch. Then Jonathan felt a presence. It was strange. Jonathan thought that the occupants were trying to communicate with him telepathically. At that time Jonathan stated he didn't believe in such things. It was like sitting in your car turning on the AM station real high. It sounds like white noise as it comes and goes. He believes it had calmed him. Looking inside, it appeared to be black like a, looking into a dark closet. Jonathan estimates the craft appeared to be about 10 meters by 20 meters in length. That's 33 feet by 66 feet. It was huge. Shaped between an egg and a teardrop and very aerodynamic. It did not appear to have smooth skin and notches that were noticeable and looked really organic. It looked like art and didn't look like something someone made in a shop. It appears as if the sun could not reflect off the craft at all. You could see the different shades of the craft. It just didn't shine or reflect. Jonathan believed the occupants were telepathically calling him to assist them and everything was going to be all right. Jonathan became very mesmerized into it. Then Sergeant Allen and Atkins started yelling and cursing at Jonathan, telling him to get the hell out of there. Jonathan believes they just became scared and didn't want him to get hurt. Altogether, Jonathan believes he was at the site for about 15 to 20 minutes. It was only Jonathan, Sergeant Allen, and Sergeant Atkins. They were the only ones who saw the craft, the confrontation. When Jonathan and the other Marines climbed out of the gorge, they were confronted by men wearing black camis. Jonathan believes he saw the DOE, the Department of Energy Personnel, were present at the location. They appeared to know about the craft. They then questioned the Marines on what they were sent there for. Jonathan then says he was arrested. All of Jonathan's gears was taken from him by the men wearing black camis. The men were older in age, 30s and 40s, and did not display any name tags or unit identifications on their uniforms. Jonathan did see other personnel wearing containment suits at the time, but doesn't know if they were government or not. There was a clearing in the jungle where two CH-47 Chinooks Army twin rotor helicopters landed and several men exited the aircraft with containment suits on. They put Jonathan on a cot and cupped both hands down and had his legs tied together with plastic tie wrap fasteners like the ones used in law enforcement. When the helicopter took off, the unidentified men started cussing at Jonathan, stating he was a d Why don't you pay attention to orders. You wasn't supposed to be there. You're not supposed to see this. You're going to be dangerous if we let you go. Jonathan believes that the men were going to kill him for about two days. A unidentified Lieutenant Colonel of the United States Air Force told Jonathan, you know, if we just took you out in the jungle, they'll never find you out there. Jonathan decided not to provoke the officer. They told him that he needed to sign some papers and that he never saw anything. You don't exist in this situation and it never happened. If you tell anybody, you'll come up missing.
Jonathan was placed in an interrogation room for about 15 hours. During that time, several men placed a light in Jonathan's face and began yelling at him. Jonathan couldn't readily identify any of these individuals except for one from the cross site. He was the one who wore black camis. He would ask questions in a grunting voice asking, what did you see? Are you a patriot? Do you like the constitution? Here, we're on our own program. We do not obey. We do what we want. We will do you and your whole family, spoken in a growling voice. We're gonna take you off in the helicopter, kick your ass out in the jungle, and we are going to end you. Jonathan stated that at no time did they physically put their hands on him. The interrogation went on for about eight or nine hours. The entire time, Jonathan was handcuffed to a chair. There were breaks, however. He was not permitted to eat or drink during this interrogation. The aftermath. After Jonathan was sent back to his command, he was at the same installation, but they had him segregated with the Air Force personnel for three weeks. Jonathan saw many other nationalities working at that location. When Jonathan got back, he approached Sergeant Allen about what happened. You see, Sergeant Allen is married with young children. Jonathan went to his house on base housing and Sergeant Allen became very upset and threw Jonathan out of the house. He said he didn't want to talk about it. Jonathan assumes that they scared those guys too. Jonathan describes the Marine Corps as monolithic that they are told something, they're going to do it. If you don't want to go along with it, you'll just be railroaded. And that is a story. As a follow-up to this video, I'm interviewing Jonathan. I'm very fortunate that he has agreed to an interview and question and answers very soon. And as soon as I get that together, I'll, um, I'll get that video released as soon as I can. If you like what you're hearing, make sure you hit that subscribe and that notification for my upcoming video. You're not going to want to miss it. Thanks for watching Military Witnesses to UAP. I'm Shannon Scott. Catch you later.